Welcome to Books of the Book. I hope you have been joining us in our study of the Book of Acts here as we've been studying along. My name is Pastor Mark Howard, and I'm here with my co-host, my brother Jim Howard, and uh, who is also a pastor, by the way. And we have been going through the Book of Acts. Uh, in our last time together, we were studying the Book of Acts, chapter 16, and the Macedonian call, mm. and how the Holy Spirit had actually said no I think that was the title that we used is when the Holy Spirit says no, because the Holy Spirit said no to Paul right. when he wanted to go in certain other places. And we found out why, because there was a need in Macedonia. And when Paul took the call to Macedonia, he and his team, the Lord really blessed them by establishing, a, establishing the Christian church at Philippi. That's right. And so we're coming through that into uh, Acts, in fact, if we're going to start in verse 40 and we're going to carry of uh, chapter 16 and carry right through to chapter 17. But before we do, we're going to ask God to bless our time in his word. So I'd invite you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word. We thank you for the spirit of truth that you have given us to lead us into all truth and Lord to bring conviction and to bring power into our lives to follow through in our uh, uh, Christian endeavors. Now we ask, Lord, as we study, that you, would that you would continue to guide us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now in Acts, uh, as I said, 16 and verse 40, we're finishing up with the previous chapter. It says, They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, who was a convert there, her whole household in mm -hmm. Philippi. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and they departed. Now they came on to... Thessalonica, we find in chapter 17, they passed through, verse 1, now when they had passed through Amphipolis, and uh, Amphipolis rather, sorry, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. Now, there's a few things, Jim, to hear that really are uh, important to us. First of all, we've touched on this before. Paul, as his custom was, mm -hmm. went into the uh, synagogue on the Sabbath day and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Uh, the first thing that grabs my attention, again, is that we find that it was Paul's custom to worship on the Sabbath, whether in the synagogue, whether by the riverside, this was a custom that he followed. Secondly, it was a custom of his to reason out of the scriptures about Christ. That's right. And this may come to a, a, a surprise to some of our viewers uh, who maybe haven't given thought to this yet, but there are many people who look at Christ and the gospel as a New Testament thing mm -hmm. and don't realize that the only scripture the apostle had here was the Old Testament. It was not the New Testament that he was preaching Christ from, That's right. but it was the Old Testament scriptures that he customarily on a regular basis preached Christ from. Mm. And we need to remember and realize and recognize that the Old Testament scriptures are full of gospel imagery. That's right. But we need to have the Holy Spirit open our understanding so that we can see that gospel imagery. And we know that, that Jesus opened the understanding of the early apostles, and, and that was a big part of, of course, Paul was trained and he understood those Old, Testament those Old Testament scriptures, but when he connected with the early church, there was also the blessing of getting all that benefit from when Jesus in Luke 24 opened to their understanding right. all the things about him in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms. That's right, and we would do well to continue to study the Scripture, Old and New Testaments, and continually ask God for new revelations of Christ in the Word. That's right. Now, it's interesting, again, in verse 4, it says, Some of them were persuaded, that is, in the synagogue, but the great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So we see that he preaches Christ from the Word, and the church grows. That's right, that's right. Now, if you look at verse 5, it uh, picks up with a common theme that we've seen before. It says, but the Jews, uh, but the Jews, <laughs> yeah. who were not persuaded, in other places it says the unbelieving Jews, yes. 
becoming envious. So it's important for us to note, again, for our viewers, you know, a lot of times the New Testament uses this language about the Jews and their anger, but we know that it wasn't all the Jews. Paul was a Jew. That's right. Many of his colleagues were Jews, and many of the Jews did believe. Of course, Jesus is a Jew, right. and so uh, in his humanity. And so it's not a, uh, not to be disparaging, we're not disparaging the Jews, but uh, it's commenting here that because of some of their preconceived ideas as a people, as a nation, they f we find them fighting against the yeah. gospel of Christ. That's right, and not accepting him as their Messiah. That's right. So these Jews were ones who were not persuaded that, that Jesus right. was the Messiah. And it says, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a moment. Fascinating, a couple of things. Um, first of all, it says, took some of the evil men from the marketplace. Well, uh, I suppose that that's from the perspective of Luke, the divinely inspired author. If they were to say, they would probably say they were well-esteemed men. <laughs> that's right. But these were evil men, if the truth be known. And we also see into the heart of these uh, Jews who are not persuaded, where he reveals once again, we've seen this before as well, that they were envious. That was really at the heart of what they were doing. They were seeing these people listening and, and, and uh, giving, heed. giving heed and accepting the words of, uh, of Paul and, and, and his team. And so we see that there was a sense of, of uh, reputation that was in the way here for these Jews who didn't believe. They, they were upset about what was happening. But you'll notice that that's not how they portray it as that's we continue. Right. But I want to point out, too... Yeah, we don't find them saying, hey, we're mad because he's getting more attention than we are. Right, they're not going to say that. We'll find out what they say. But it's notable, too, that they, again, gathered these evil men from the marketplace to create this uproar. I mean, you know, envy will lead you to do a lot of awful things. And they may have been justifying themselves, rationalizing that it wasn't envy. Mm. But at the end of the day, they were joining forces with people that they knew very well were not in harmony with the will of God as expressed to them and as they knew it from the oracles of God. Anyway, in verse 6 it says, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So here's the picture. They, uh, they say, these men they, who have turned the world upside down. Can you think of a better compliment? Yeah, <laughs> than, amen. Yeah, amen. They turned the world upside down. Praise the Lord. That, that shows the effectiveness that was happening. That's right. And the way the word was spreading from city to city, even in these Gentile cities. And then it says, uh, they're acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Now comes uh, out they their were so facade. Concerned That's for Caesar. <laughs> That's right. They're concerned for Caesar and the fact that Didn't there was not enough respect. Envy. Right. Nothing about envy. Only the lack of respect for Caesar was their reason, but the Bible reveals that it was actually envy. So then they, you know, they can't really do much more, so they take. That's not the first time we've heard about concern for Caesar. That's right. You go back to uh, the, the trial of Jesus, and they said, We have no king but Caesar and certainly uh, made it appear that Jesus was an enemy of Caesar. Yeah, Pilate, if you go through with this, you're not Caesar's That's right, friend. Exactly. So we mm -hmm. recognize that when really someone wants, someone who's driven by envy and greed wants to accomplish something, they will oftentimes resort to, um, to things that are lower their dignity and their honesty. And maybe they rationalize that what they were doing was really true but the truth is there was envy lurking in the heart, and that can produce some pretty wicked things, that's and that's right. what we see here. Well, we go on in verse 10 to find out, of course, they found Jason, but they couldn't find the apostles. Verse 10 says, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, so they're trying to whisk them away and protect them. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, it says in verse 11 something interesting. These were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Mm -hmm. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Now, a couple things here that are important. First of all, um, it says that 
they were more fair-minded in that they received the word and searched the scriptures. These were the people of Berea and even today in Christianity. In fact, I've been through, I think there's a whole chain of Christian bookstores called Berean bookstores. There's a yeah. publisher called Berean Books. Berean is a word that's used in Christianity today as people who study. study they don't the just Bible. take what they hear. Right. They, the Bere they were good Bereans. They searched the scriptures. But what's interesting to me is this, Jim, that a I've run into a number of people that think they're good Bereans because they're skeptics. Mm -hmm. When you try to share something, they're always like, well, I don't know about that. And they question and, 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 and they're skeptical about everything. That's not how these people were. It says they received the word with All readiness things. of mind. Right. In other words, they were open to it. They weren't hesitant and skeptical. Now, they were still going to go and, and, and search the scriptures to confirm it but they had an openness about them. And sometimes I've seen people who, who cover their skepticism in this air of, uh, I'm just gonna study it out and be faithful to God. But oftentimes it's not an attempt to be, a desire to be faithful to God, but to hold on to their own views. And so they're gonna be skeptical of anything that they don't think. And that's not being a good Berean. That's not being a good Berean. Right. That is not what we're finding here. They, because of they were fair-minded and open-minded, uh, and, and, and receive the word with readiness. They still search the scriptures to find out whether these things were so. I get, they, the, I get the sense when they say readiness that it's like giving somebody the benefit of the doubt, you know? Instead of starting from the premise that uh, I'm gonna critically examine this and point out what's wrong, you give someone the benefit of the doubt and listen with an open mind, and then after receiving, then you can go back and confirm or deny. But, but I agree with you. There are many people who take that approach where they have a critical view of things and they pride themselves in that because they don't take any man's say so and yeah. they only take the word, but the reality is they're, they're not, not really being word. like the Bereans. That's right. No, they're not taking the word. And, and so it's interesting that you bring that up uh, about being, uh, how did you say that? They, giving the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Because where mine says uh, in the New King James, these were more fair-minded, my marginal reading, and some translations word it this way, they were more noble. Mm. And, and you think of that being noble, being fair to people, yeah. you know, and that's where yeah. the fair-minded, yeah, giving people the benefit of the doubt. And so <clears throat> we go on here. Uh, there were many who believed, but verse 13 gives us a picture we've seen before. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and refuted him from the scriptures. Mm. No, nope, never. They stirred up the crowds. <laughs> right. You know, they never go to scripture. They stirred up the crowds, and then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and received a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, and they departed. So he moves on again to another place. Why? Because they stirred up the crowds against him. That's right. So we're going to move on to Athens, but first we need to take a break. So we're going to break, and, and I hope you stick with us and come back in just a few moments as we see Paul as he goes on to Athens and what mighty things God does there. Stay with us. Are you searching for meaning in your life? Are you longing for an enduring peace within your heart? Have you concluded that all the money in the world cannot provide this? I find it amazing how some people can live far away from any town, out in the wilderness where the days are relatively silent and serene, and yet have no inner peace. Anxiety is their constant foe, restlessness the monkey on their back. And then there are those who can live in the middle of a city, in the midst of chaos, surrounded by crime and noise, and yet be restful and have peace within. Enduring peace is something that God offers you today, not being dependent on the environment that surrounds you. Listen to God's words in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. If you want quietness to replace restlessness and assurance to replace worry and fear, I encourage you to invite Jesus into your heart. Only Jesus can subdue all worry and fear and calm the troubled waters within. For only Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Welcome back to Books of the Book. Before our break, Mark, we were walking through this experience of the Apostle Paul where he was ministering in Berea. And as we've seen in other places, uh, there was a group that didn't believe and stirred up the crowds and once again Paul was kicked out of town. That's right. And so Paul is sent off to Athens 
And we pick up in verse 16 of the story in Athens, which is an incredible story. Let's begin there in verse 16, reading. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Mm. Now, just think about that for a moment. The Apostle Paul was provoked, his spirit was provoked within him. Here he is, he comes into this place where there's such little knowledge of the true God. And he looks on the crowds and his spirit is provoked. You can sense the love for souls, the love for the salvation of humanity that Paul had. And it reminds me of Jesus. I remember in the Gospels it speaks about how Jesus, when he looked upon the multitudes, that he was moved with compassion. Mm -hmm. And it says that he saw that they were, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so we, here we have uh, this group of people who, who should have been given the knowledge of salvation by now if God's people had done their work. That's right. But instead, they're in this ignorance of the, of the salvation of God. They're not just idolatrous. They're given over to idolatry. Right. They're steeped so deeply where Paul probably wonders, how am I going to right. reach these people? That's right. They're, in, they're entrenched. So then in verse 17, it says, Therefore, he, therefore, because of his deep love and his mm -hmm. spirit being provoked, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. <laughs> that sounds like everybody, doesn't That's it? Right. So there were the Jews, the Gentiles who were, who were going to the synagogue and who were worshipers, and then anybody really who breathed. <laughs> this, was, this wasn't a meeting in the marketplace. This was those who happened, happened to, to be, be there. there. It wasn't That's a right. scheduled anything. It was so you get this sense that the Apostle Paul was involved in what we might call lifestyle evangelism. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just somebody who only uh, you know, was on the clock during certain hours and off the clock and others. Wherever he was, he was preaching the Lord Jesus. And there he was in the marketplace, and whoever happened to be there, he was sharing the word. So you get the sense, too, that there's these worshipers. They're the ones who have, a, have an understanding of God. They don't have a full understanding of God, and he needs to definitely communicate to them and try to reach them, especially the Gentile worshipers mm -hmm. who have a less understanding than the Jewish ones. But then there's also this class that we might call unchurched today. They've, they've, they've got no understanding, and he meets with them right. in the marketplace. He's, he's spreading his message to everyone. Then it says in verse 18, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Mm -hmm. Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And this is, this is where it gets interesting. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him to the uh, Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange thing to our ears. You would think that would be a negative thing. You're bringing some strange thing. But then it says, Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Just the fact that it was strange didn't deter them, and we find out why. That's right. It says in verse 21, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was sharing some strange thing, that didn't upset them or make them not want to hear. In fact, it made them want to hear. And there they were sitting there doing what they always do, wanting to hear some new thing. And it fascinates me that, I've uh, known Christians like that. Yeah, yeah, that this is not altogether gone. You know, this, this is certainly talking about Athens, but this idea of some new thing, you know, sensational ideas. So many come to uh, an understanding of the truth and, and they're, they're growing in it, but for whatever reason, it doesn't, it begins to, they begin to get bored with it. And they move on and they start coming up with sensational, fanatical views and, and they're, they move from one view to another. And uh, certainly that happened in this day with the philosophies of the day mm. here in Athens. But I can't help but think also that it's possible that even the study of the Bible and theology can lead someone down a wrong path if all they do is spend their time researching and trying to study some new thing. The study of the Bible should never be disparaged, but let's look at the Apostle Paul as an example. He was someone, he spent time studying, he wrote letters that are full of theology, but when you look at his life, he spent it focusing 
on the purpose of that theology and the focus of that theology, which was the salvation of humanity through Jesus Christ. So he was focused on the mission of, 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 and the cause of God, and that focus helped him to understand the true meaning of the theology in the scriptures that he was a student of. That's right. There's a practical side of theology that helps us to better understand the theology. And I can't help but think, and I'm sure our viewers will relate to this, at least some of them, uh, especially the fathers who have had to put together toys for their children. <laughs> and uh, you get that page of instructions and you say to yourself when you're halfway through it, I wish the guys who put these things together, these instructions, instructions. together, had to put one of these toys together with their own <laughs> instructions just once. That's right. You know? And then, because there's a, there's, you know, there's a theory, right. but the practical side of things really tempers the theory sometimes. And as you're mentioning, in theology, if, if all we're doing is entertaining ideologies, grand right. themes of Christianity, sometimes they will lose any practical significance for the common people. And they actually become a little bit distorted and, 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 and you can't really truly understand them until they're put into practical application and then their full understanding comes to light. That's right. Well, it's interesting as we go on here then, Paul is meeting here in Athens, meeting in the marketplace and what have you, and he's got an appointment with these uh, Epicurean philosophers and others that uh, to share with them. And we're going to verse 22, the Bible says in, uh, that Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus, and this was a place in Athens that was the, it was the place for sharing, you know, what they understood to be mm -hmm. knowledge and truth. And here Paul has this opportunity to share with these men of Athens. And he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now, this is a really crafty idea by crafty. the apostle. He sees, he's looking for an opportunity, and he just happens upon this monument or altar that says to the unknown God, he already sees that the gods that they are worshiping are, are in character, are totally different from mm. the true God. Mm. So he takes this opportunity to introduce them to the unknown God. And he says to them in verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now, what's interesting here, Jim, is the mindset of their religion, of pagan religion, and in reality, Truth be told, all false religion is that man has to do something to come into good favor with God. God needs something from us in order to act. And Paul makes a point here that God made everything. He doesn't need anything from right. us. He is the originator of everything and the giver of every good gift. God who made all things is not worshiped with men's hands. Mm. That was totally different from the gods they knew. It truly was an unknown God. And so he goes on to say, God is not needing from us. He's the one who gives life and breath in all things. Verse 26, but, uh, I'm sorry, and he has made from one blood, speaking about going back to the origins now of Adam, from one man, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That would be the time periods that men live in and the the geographic locations they live in. Mm -hmm. God has a plan for every one of us, and He puts us in a place and a time where we can make a difference. Where, not only where we can make a difference, but where He can reach us. And we see this in the next part. He, he uh, determined the, the, the place where they were going to be, their pre determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may f find him, though he is not, that, that they may grope for him mm. and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. That's it's correct. interesting language there to grope for something is as yeah. if you're blind in yes. darkness and you, you're groping for something that's hard to find, but then he makes the point, he's not far from us. That's right. He's not hard to find. The reason that we don't find him sometimes 
is because of the way we're searching or not searching for, and maybe we're looking for a different kind of God. So he presents this God to them, the unknown God, for in him we live and move and have our being, mm -hmm. as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God and not like, uh, we, we ought not to think of the divine nature like gold or silver or stone, like these men's idols and what have you. And then he says in verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, mm. but now commands all men everywhere to uh, uh, repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, etc. So he says, powerful. Yeah, you may have been in ignorance, but God has given you the opportunity. And in the times of our ignorance, God overlooks it. But it, we are in ignorance no more. I'm presenting something to you, he says, and now you need to make a decision for the real, true God. That's right. Amen. You know, you look at verse 32 to see uh, the response, and you find out that I think that somehow Paul was, uh, I don't want to say cut off, but he was, he was no longer going to be heard by most of those who were listening. Because in verse 32 it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So some mocked, mm -hmm. which certainly, you know, they, they didn't believe. They, they, were, they were Greeks. Remember uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul says that the Christ crucified is to the Greeks foolishness. That's right. And so the whole idea of these supernatural experiences of the resurrection were also foolishness. And so they weren't going to hear that. They were mocking others because they were interested in any new thing, said, hey, we'll hear you again, <laughs> but we don't have record of that happening. But then in verse 34, or verse 33, it says, So Paul departed from among them, how after, however, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius and, uh, I'm sorry, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So you get this idea of some that, that, that responded. But I want you to notice what happened uh, in previous places, like in Thessalonica. Go back to chapter 17, verse 4 in Thessalonica, and it says, uh, a great multitude of the devout Greeks mm -hmm. responded. In chap uh, chapter 17, verse 12, it says, Therefore, many of them believed in Berea. But here in Athens, just some men joined him. That's right. You don't get the sense that this, this crafty argument worked all that well in Athens. And the Apostle Paul is about to go to Corinth, and he makes a decision at the end of his ministry at Athens that, that has a deep effect on his ministry in Corinth. And we find that in 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2. He says in verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined, I decided, not to know anything among you, the Corinthians, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm. So here in Athens, he used logic and argumentation. But he discovered that that wasn't as effective as simply speaking and appealing to the heart about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm, How about you, viewer? Are you ready to accept Jesus Christ and Him crucified? We hope you'll join us next time as we dive in further on Books of the Book.